spirit of citizen volunteers, um, our keynote today is a woman who has taken citizen science to a whole new level. Alyssa and Paul set out early last summer to paddle the entire length of the Mississippi River by kayak and, water monitor, uh, and monitor water conditions along the way. And she was just telling me that uh, when she started up in Minnesota that, the, that, that the, mis the bugs were so bad that at night she would dream about all these different ways to keep the bugs off herself, but that she was so excited about her trip it didn't bother her as much and that she was happy it was the beginning of the trip that was all buggy. Um, so today she's going to share with you guys her, her journey. A part of that was um, she was gathering water samples every hundred miles and sent them to the adventurers and scientists for conservation. And they're looking at microplastics in freshwater as a research project. And so she joined this crowdsourcing effort worldwide to look at these tiny particles of plastic and where are we finding them in our waters. Um, and on that note, I'm happy to point out that last year, it's rather timely, Wisconsin State Assembly passed critical legislation phasing out the manufacture and sale, sale of microbeads, um, microbead containing products. So one step closer to, to looking at some of those issues. So today Alyssa will share her results as well as the, what I'm excited to hear about, all those tales along the, the river. So please join me in welcoming her. Thanks. I'm so, so excited to be here. Um, thank you, Eric and Tim, for inviting me. Uh, last night at the banquet, um, being in the presence of so many amazing lifetime volunteer citizen scientists, I was like, oh my god, what am I doing? I'm just a beginner. I don't know. Um, but I hope that my, uh, my stories will um, inspire you to keep doing what you're doing. Um, and let's go. Let's see. Uh, so. Um, I will also be sharing some information um, during one of the sessions this afternoon, so I'll be focusing on the specific data that I collected then. Um, so this is more just sort of like fun lunchtime uh, story time. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go over what I did, why I did it. I'm going to focus on the lessons that I learned along the way and uh, briefly what you can do. So. Um, Turns out I was the second solo female kayaker to uh, paddle the entire length of the Mississippi River. Um, I met the third who started five days after me and uh, she caught up to me about halfway through and we ended up finishing together. Um, so that was kind of cool. Um, I was documenting plastic waste and water quality along the way and I did it in three main ways. So Primarily, um, well not primarily, three different ways. One of them was more qualitative and that was to take pictures and videos and write about what I was seeing along the way um, and share it with you in this format as well. If you weren't uh, aware of my trip during it, um, these speaking enga engagements are a really great way to, to share um, some of what I learned too. Um, and then quantitatively, every five to 15 miles-ish I was, um, oh, well, before that. Um, so every 100 miles, I was collecting a liter of water and sending it to the adventurers and scientists for conservation, and they would dry out the sample and uh, check for microplastics um, as part of their worldwide uh, freshwater microplastics project that they're working on. And I would send them off. I, they, they're heavy. A, a liter of water is heavy, and I'm carrying around in these, this, you know, my, my kayak is tiny, and. Anyway, I would send them off when I got three or four of them. And then um, I was also every 12-ish miles um, measuring water quality uh, with a uh, water quality probe, um, dissolved oxygen, total dissolved solids, temperature, uh, conductivity. And so my background is in uh, marine science and conservation, um, coastal resiliency, those sorts of things. And I was noticing that um, I was working at the National Association of Counties for a couple of years with a fellowship and I realized that a lot of the counties in the country obviously are not coastal but everything that counties do inland affects the coast um, and so I wanted to do something to kind of bring attention to that fact and remind people that it's all connected and that 
even if you never see an ocean, your, Im your, your life impacts um, the health of our oceans. Um, my fellowship was a two-year fellowship, so when it finished, I was unemployed. <laughs> so that was a really good motivator to, to get up and do something. Um, it gets really annoying sitting and applying and always being the first runner-up. So I decided that I had a lot of um, ability to do good work and decided that I didn't need to ask permission to do it. So I looked um, at what sort of data had been collected in the Mississippi River. It was like, well, the largest navigable freshwater that I know is the Mississippi. Let's try that. Um, and there was very little data collected lengthwise. And so I was like, well, what about plastics? What about basic water quality stuff? And I couldn't find hardly any information. So I was like, great, that's easy. I can do those things. Um, and then also I had been living in two, for two years in Washington, D.C., and I really needed some quality time. Um, I first had this idea. I had it in a dream. Um, in my dream, I was paddling down a river with my two cats in my canoe. And um, I woke up in the morning, and my friend was there. And I told her this dream. And she was like, that's great. You're going to need a floppy hat. <laughs> So um, I, I eventually was talked out of taking my cats with me, um, but I did get a floppy hat, and um, you can. This is I'm wearing the the silk scarf that was around it, um, and I've collected little pieces along the way, and I've added my I'm a citizen science um, pin to it, so that's exciting. Um, but you can kind of follow uh, the journey in the pictures. You'll see how my straw hat uh, gets more and more floppy and more and more disintegrated. <laughs> Um, it, it fell off and kind of blew off my um, hat off my boat one night, and I woke up and it was gone. I was so sad, and uh, luckily I had brought this uh, extra hat, and this was the only time I wore that extra hat because I actually found my hat floating in the river <laughs> a few miles down the way, and there it is with some uh, duct tape on it. It got a lot more duct tape and a lot more mold. <laughs> Um, so this is an important project because 37% of our uh, continental U.S. landmass uh, drains into the Gulf of Mexico uh, and drains into the Mississippi River. So when you see people throwing a cigarette butt out the window, it ends up in a ditch, which ends up in a little stream, which ends up in a bigger stream, which ends up in a little river, which ends up eventually in the Mississippi. and. Um, you know, often ends up in the bellies of uh, ocean critters. So um, that's a lot. That's a lot of space. Okay. Um, so these are if you're if you have to go and you want to take a one screenshot of what what matters from this. This is your screenshot. So these are my lessons learned. I'm going to go through them uh, one by one. So. Preparation is important, but it's not everything. Basically, you need food, you need equipment, um, but assuming that you have those basic things, um, I think more importantly to, to be able to do an expedition like this, your attitude is really what gets you through. And I'll be talking a lot more about this as we go through pictures. Excuse me. Um, it's, um, you know, sometimes you are huddled up in a rainstorm and there's lightning and you can't get out of the boat because you're in a marsh and there's nowhere to get out and there's mosquitoes attacking you and you think what the frick did I say this is the stupidest thing I've ever done and then and then you the the rainstorm passes and you're like but I told all those people that I'm going to collect data and if I stopped now they would just think that I'm an idiot <laughs> right cuz cuz continuing wouldn't make me an idiot I don't um, anyway, but yeah, you just got to stay the course. Um, and then also having people to lean on is like, ah, people are amazing. Okay, so um, I ate a very lot of dried oatmeal. Um, the first night that I was on the river, my um, stove died. So <laughs> the first month I didn't have any hot food. Um, and so I mostly ate cold, crunchy food with water that I just like sat there and um, a lot of lot of oatmeal. This is more of my food preparations. Um, and then equipment. Um, took me several, several hours to figure out the first time how this was actually going to work. Um, but there it is. 
Um, and then, so I took a picture one time. <laughs> here's all my stuff that I have, and here's how it all like goes in the front of the boat, in the back of the boat, on top of the boat, inside, between my legs. There's like no extra room, but I was good at it, and I got really good at knowing that not everything had to be dry, and by the end of the trip, everything was piled on top. It didn't absolutely have to be dry because it was just that much easier. <laughs> my, it was so top heavy and sketchy. Anyway, um, I am really, really grateful to uh, Xylem. Uh, the YSA, YSI Sond was loaned to me for this project. Thank you. Um, so I had never been kayaking before. Um, I <laughs> I, uh, this is me. I, I bought my kayak on Craigslist in St. Louis or St. Um, St. Paul, and uh, hoped that it floated. And at the beginning, it's just a creek, and it doesn't matter if it floats because you can stand in the river, and that's it. Um, but luckily, it did. It did. It mostly floated. I only had to um, figure out why it was leaking once. Um, more preparation food stuff. So the second lesson is that there are some amazing people in the world, and if you ever want to rekindle your faith in humanity, go paddle the Mississippi River. Um, you've got your river rats. These are, this, this picture is of what I like to call my river family. Um, this is Jake and Julie and Leanne, and Jake and Julie were a couple from Boston who were canoeing, uh, and Leanne was the other solo kayaker, and they all st started five days after me, and so we ended up passing and staying together um, and, and hanging out quite a lot. Jake and Julie, me and Leanne, more me and Leanne. Um, I met some amazing other paddlers, long distance paddlers along the way. This is Dale Sanders. He's 80 years old, and he paddled the Mississippi River in like half the amount of time that I did. It's freaking incredible. Um, he's definitely one of my um, like heroes. He's amazing. Um, he lives in Nashville, and I got to go see him in his amazing dungeon of everything cool. <laughs> Um, and then these are some other um, long distance paddlers and people who encourage cat paddling and exploring the Mississippi River um, professionally. They, they take people out on the river. And then there are, this is a guy I met in Prairie du Chien who um, paddled the river several times. And apparently one time he was paddling with his buddy and they got into, they wanted to see how fast they could paddle the river and they kept daring each other to do stupider things to see like who would do the worst crappy things. And so one night they were like, I dare you to, to stay the night like under that bird they was like this tiny little rock, and they were just like camped up on the rock. There's, they weren't camping, they were just curled on, just like bird poop on. Anyway, they just uh, thought that was a really fun way to spend their time. I don't know. <laughs> Interesting guys. Sometimes the river rats are also river angels and take very good care of you. Um, uh, this is Big Muddy Mike in St. Louis. He's an amazing uh, guru of all things long distance paddling. Um, sometimes the river angels live right on the river and offer you a place to stay either camping in their backyard, like this awesome place, or sometimes they even let you stay in their bed, which is really great. Um, they share with you their culture and things that matter to them. There's a lot of fishermen. Um, they will take you in when it's uh, four days of rain and there's nowhere else to go. They take you to amazing little dive places to eat and they bring you marshmallows if you, they, they'll be like, oh, I saw you were coming through. I'm on Facebook, uh, what do you need? I wanna help you. I'm like, I don't really need anything. Really, I really wanna help you. Okay, how about some marshmallows? Here's your marshmallows. <laughs> right on. <laughs> um, uh, this is Chester. He's a character and a half who I met down in um, Louisiana, and he took care of us. He took us in on a very, very rainy Halloween. I'll show you those pictures in a minute. He had a bath. That was cool. <laughs> and he was crazy. There's my hat. Look at my hat with like five different colors of <laughs> duct tape. <laughs> um, they, you know, river angels also take you around and show you some places that you can't necessarily see if you're just on the river. This is in Winona, um, and it's a really cool little town. Uh, they talk to you when it's pouring outside and make you hot coffee. Uh, and sometimes they just like stop and chat and they're like, what's going on? And then they give you some, 
some sandwiches and beer. <laughs> or they let you go and feed the local raccoon who comes every night for dinner. This is Rocky. <laughs> Um, this is the very last day, right before we were um, getting ready to meet uh, up with the Gulf of Mexico. We found these two guys who were just freaking hilarious, and we were just talking and talking and talking with them. And then we looked at our watch and realized, oh my God, this is the last day, and we're going to miss it. <laughs> we're going to get to the Gulf of Mexico at, after dusk, and we can't do that. So they were very nice, and we, we paddled, you know, 2,300 plus miles, and they were like, don't sweat it, we're gonna pull you three miles. <laughs> Sometimes the river angels are just other people's cats. <laughs> or they'll take you to a nature center. <laughs> um, let's see, I met some other adventures. These are a couple, uh, so Jake and Julie and I were at, the, at breakfast one morning and uh, it was pouring outside and this person came in, he was on a bicycle, and, and Jake had done some long distance biking. He was like, hey, I see your bike, come on and have breakfast with us. And he, had, he was crossing America on his bike. 10 minutes later, this other woman comes, same thing, huge bicycle, we invite her over, she's crossing America on her bike, the opposite direction, and all of us were like eating breakfast together, it was crazy. Um, this is a random guy in, um, his name is Dave. But um, he is in Cape Girardeau, and he's somebody who really was very pleased um, to hear about my project. He, uh, to look at him, he kind of looks like a junkie or something like that. He's a, he, and he doesn't speak very well, but when I shared what I was doing, he said, you know, all my life I've lived down by the river, and I come every day, and I, I clean up everybody else's trash. Um, and so he's doing the good work, and uh, he flies under the radar. Most people don't know that he's there doing that. Nobody thanks him, and um, I was really happy to be able to meet some people like him. Uh, I also met some other environmentalists. This gentleman showed me some of the work that he was doing in Catfish Creek near Des Moines, Iowa. Um, that was a really, really cool day. And then we met some other children. They were just going for a walk with their classroom, um, and we were packing up our boats in the morning and they were like, what are you doing? So we got to show them everything that we were doing and explain sort of the uh, science aspect of what we were doing and it was really cool to interact with the kids. We ended up getting on the water like three hours late because it was just so cool to hang out with those kids. We meet other children who were also all about picking up trash, especially when they're balls to play with. Um, and my sponsors, um, I had a, had a Kickstarter uh, campaign to fund this. Um, insert picture of sponsors, sorry. <laughs> um, so the number three lesson is that the river takes. Um, I lost a GPS unit, a camera, two phones. Um, one day, the only time I didn't put my uh, kayak cover on my kayak to take a nap, of course, the waves were crazy and it completely submerged my boat and all of my food was in the cockpit and um, I destroyed most of my food and that was really annoying. Um, and then one night when we were just above uh, St. Louis, we were camped right where the uh, Missouri and the Min Mississippi meet. We had pulled our boats up off the river and in the middle of the night, Leanne's kayak had gone back into the river. Um, and so we woke up and there was no kayak. And that was kind of terrible. <laughs> um, we spent the day trying to figure out what to do and being stranded and uh, that's another story. But uh, it ended up finding its way into um, a place like 14 miles down the road and people were like, is this your, they called us, somehow they found my number and they um, were like, this is your kayak, we have everything. And the only thing that had been lost off her kayak was like a Gatorade bottle, which was amazing. Um, usually you don't get to recover things like that. So she was very lucky. Um, but we learned after that you tie up your kayak, even if it's to your tent, because there's nothing else to tie it up to. <laughs> Um, we, so I collected all this data the whole time and the data that I'm going to talk about will mostly be in the next session, but just briefly, um, obviously there are things along the way like cities and 
uh, you know, very locally, some of these factories, you can see a t temperature difference, that kind of thing locally in the river. There's tons and tons of plastic. I, I, at the beginning, my goal was to pick up every piece of plastic that I saw, and that's just impossible. <laughs> I quickly learned that, but um, for a while, I was trying to do that. Um, I tried to do a beach cleanup every day. Uh, sometimes there was just way too much, and of course I was hampered by how much I could carry on my boat, so I would basically fill up one bag and that's all I could carry with me. Um, found some pretty interesting things, not just plastic bottles, but also squirt guns and golf things. <laughs> and then up in the top there, whoops, you can see these are really old, uh, muscles that they used to make the pearl buttons with, which is really cool. Um, this is just one beach that just had a ton of them. It was really, really cool to find, because these are like, you know, they phased these out in the 40s, so finding this many is really, really fun. Uh, and then in Muscatine, which was nearby, I don't know if you can see, but near the power and water there, I think the image there is of those muscles with the holes cut out. So it's ingrained in the history. There's trash everywhere, and even the beautiful things like old stumps are wrapped in trash, ropes. And that's the front of my bow of my boat with a trash bag on the front. I was like this trash lady, and there's another one. <laughs> and then me with the huge, I, I realized that they make really great backrests. Um, but this is up in the headwaters, probably about the first three or four hundred miles of the Mississippi is super, super clear. This is like 30 feet deep and you can see to the bottom. Um, and the Mississippi is called Big Muddy, but it doesn't get muddy um, for several hundred miles, which to me makes me think, well, if it can be that clean up in the headwaters where it's super muddy, why can't it actually be mm, this clear or at least somewhat clearer uh, further down? This is the first place that I noticed that it looked muddy, and you can see there's pasture land and mud going straight into the water, which can't be great. And then getting to St. Paul and um, Minneapolis, the amount of trash that I saw just <laughs> was crazy. Um, so I, that was the point at which I was like, okay, just do what you can, can't pick it all up. This is the confluence of the Ohio on the left and the Mississippi on the right. And behind me, if you can see, sort of, the Ohio is kind of bluish green and the Mississippi is kind of brown. And that separation in color kind of mingled, it took about two or three miles before it kind of mingled into one river, which is awesome to see. And, and those data are reflected in, um, in the uh, numbers too. Uh, and then this is just a piece of plastic. It's a, a nipple <laughs> from a bottle uh, next to a raccoon print, just kind of showing that plastic involves our critters and um, negatively impacts not just humans, but everybody else that lives in, in the area. Uh, sometimes the trash that you find is pretty interesting. I found this Ganesh just sitting in the river. Um, so I tied it up and put it on the front of my boat. <laughs> Oops. Uh, fifth thing that I learned is that practice is really cool. So this is, um, speaking of Ganesh, this is a yoga sutra, which is paraphrased uh, to be that practice becomes firmly grounded when practiced for a long time without interruption and with earnest devotion. So anything doing is worth doing well and for a long time. Um, Turns out I got good at kayaking, which made me really enjoy it. <laughs> um, and data collection, I mean, the first few times I did data collection, I'm like, ah, what am I doing? And then by the end, it was like, boop, boop, done. Uh, this is me with my, I have a muscle, guys. <laughs> I've never had upper body strength before, and this was really exciting. <laughs> That's Leanne flexing her muscles. Um, so we got really good at paddling at night, mostly because the wind was less strong and the wind was usually against you. So you could get farther, faster, and more quietly um, at night. So we paddled a lot at night, either early in the evening and early in the morning as well. Um, and that allowed us to 
paddle 100 miles in a day just to see if we could. Um, we went from Carothersville, Tennessee to um, Nashville. This is Nashville. And we did it. We did 100 miles in a day. It was hard for me to do five miles in a day when I started. So um, that was a pretty exciting uh, accomplishment for us. And we got to, say, um, to sign Dale Sanders' uh, wall. Uh, he, at, he was like, well, not many people do 100 miles in a day. Do you want to start a Centurion Club? We are like, yeah! So that was exciting. Um, one of the things that I had expected was that, you know, 2,300 miles, 2,400 miles, it's going to get boring at some point. I kind of expected everything to be really industrial like this, and certainly there were moments that were industrial like this, but I was never bored. I, I was really surprised at that. Um, number one, getting good at something, doing something that you love doing is great, but also just being outside doesn't matter where you are. The sky is always there, the water is always there, and they're always different. It is amazing. So then I have a bazillion pictures of outside never being boring, and I'm going to just kind of let you see some of these pictures, going through beaver dams. It's, uh, it's not always beautiful either. <laughs> Sometimes it's really, really annoying and wet and cold. Uh, tons and tons of bald eagles, which is really fun. These are some of the first islands. They get bigger. <laughs> this is Prescott. First, first, it was, it was so exciting. I was like, oh, I'm finally not in Minnesota. So, because a third of the river is in Minnesota, which I didn't know because it's so windy and tiny and switchbacky for the first uh, third of the, of the trip. People were like, you started in June. Where are you? You're still in Minnesota. Why are you still in? You're going to be like, it's going to take you a year. <laughs> I was like, no, it's not. Some crazy big sandbars down south. Birds, the friendly kind. And we saw some frogs. These little toads like to hide under your tent. We saw some other frogs. <laughs> Leland, Mississippi is the hometown of um, Jim Henson, so we got to stop there, and that was actually pretty fun. <laughs> Pelicans are so cool. And you, you find that, like, I took this picture early on, and I was like, wow, that's a cool picture. And then I was like, that works. I'm going to keep doing it. <laughs> Tons of little flies. Little, there's a um, black dragonfly on top of my stuff there. It's kind of hidden amongst all the crap. Um, this was kind of interesting. I mean, it doesn't look like much, but I just really loved for miles and miles at a time, you just have these this striation of like the rocks and then a little bit of greenery and then the black bottom of these willow trees and then the green. It's just kind of like a big, long miles and miles and miles of that striation. This little guy, it was super, super windy one day, and I was hugging the shore, and I couldn't, I got tired of paddling against the wind, and I just kind of stopped for a second. And this little guy was hanging out there, too, and we just kind of stared at each other for a while. It's 
the deer eating maybe some milfoil. <laughs> Duck bones. Sometimes I was like, I'm just gonna go off the beaten path. This looks like a shortcut. And then I would get stuck in these um, bogs <laughs> of, of um, algae and it would take forever and I would be very embarrassed at myself. This is my basic set setup. Um, my little tent and my li that's home. <laughs> and this, I I was sick this night, um, and so I stayed at this place a couple nights actually. And there was a um, one thing that was really cool is that when I started, um, all of the baby eagles were still in the nest. And then as I got further south, they started getting pushed out of the nest. And so at this place, there was this um, young juvenile who had been pushed out, and he was so petulant, and he just sat on this, um, he sat on this post all night long and was like, ah, I don't want to get my own food. Ah. I was like, I'm trying to sleep here. There's a 17-foot crocodile. It's longer than my boat. Crocodile, alligator. A spoonbill. And even when you're in an RV park, it's still beautiful. <laughs> it's invasive, but it's pretty. <laughs> Story of my life, <laughs> she says. <laughs> More trash. <laughs> More crawdad. This is, okay, so this is another example of me being like, I'm going to take a shortcut. I'm going to go behind this island. And then you get to the end, and it's like, oh, it's just a huge peninsula. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> There's a beaver. And you see some weird things, like this isn't really an island, but it's got a flag on it. <laughs> lots and lots of uh, paddle boats, too. And some interesting, just found that, that was kind of one of the coolest things that I found. And barges turning corners and being enormous, missing them, trying to stay out of their way. Um, one day, I sailed. 30 miles with my umbrella. <laughs> I taught Leanne how to do it too. <laughs> All right, so number seven, it, um, the last, uh, uh, is it the last? It's the second to last. Satisfaction is really. Um, awesome part of expeditions. So every day is really hard work. There's um, a lot of difficult things to have to do, like portages, those were terrible. Um, this is uh, one, the first dam that I had to portage my boat around. And then after you portage, you have to put everything back in your boat. And this is the first time that I got to clean my boat, which was halfway through the journey. It was disgusting. And lots and lots of fun, physical ailments to deal with, um, storms to deal with, paddling through the storms like a drowned rat. <laughs> this is uh, Hurricane Patricia they came through. Um, I thought that I was going to be able to paddle with just my umbrella. No, I pulled over and then we ended up having to get rescued off the river actually um, from a, a nearby person who um, came and picked us up. We had to paddle at night through the storm 13 miles to get to a place where he could pick us up. That was less than fun. Uh, sunburns, this is my hand. I had gloves on, so it got sunburned at the tip, and then I lost my gloves, so it got sunburned to, the, to where my sleeve could go. So it was like Neapolitan hands. But I, then I, I learned, at least for my face, my hands just kind of got tannish, but my face, I realized that I could um, do something about it. So I paddled a lot like that. 
um, and my, my joints were falling apart. Um, I've got a connective tissue disorder on top of everything, so that was fun to deal with. I just was literally taping my body together at the end. And then packing up um, everything at, on a daily basis was just like, oh my God, every day do I still have to do this? Yes, ah. Uh. And you'd get to the boat and you're like, I'm gonna pack up, and then it somehow it all explode. And, <laughs> and some places are easy to pack up than others. This is like, I was like hanging off the dock to be able to pack up. Tons of mud, tons of locks and dams to go through. And, uh, but you have fun along the way anyway, so when you have a, there's my hat falling apart before I got the duct tape on it. Um, you know, a, a storm happens, you just come off the water and you just stay inside and take party pictures in the bathroom because what else are you gonna do? And we carve pumpkins. <laughs> Traveling with pumpkins on a kayak is probably not the most efficient thing. Um, this is Leanne playing her violin paddle <laughs> and being very silly. And this is my, um, this was my full skirt or what I like to call my um, um, formal attire. <laughs> and one day Julie was like, let's watch a movie on my phone. I have coverage. So we sat in the camp and watched a movie. It was pretty, I, f I was like, are we cheating? Is this allowed? <laughs> On Halloween, um, I was like, the only thing that I could possibly be with this hat is a scarecrow. <laughs> um, and Leanne had with her, for some reason, a tiny bear costume. <laughs> she loves bow ties. So that's the bear in her bear den. And me being a scarecrow, and this is my, uh, my Sesame Street uh, lunchbox that I got in Leland and filled with um, my two favorite things, candy and uh, athletic tape. <laughs> and unfortunately, it started pouring, pouring rain, and I, that's me inside of my tent with my umbrella because my uh, tent had died at this point, and I, it was like raining inside my tent. And then it was coming up from the bottom as well because it was all mud. And at that point, we heard this dude kind of yell something unintelligible and figured out he, he had like the thickest, amazing Louisiana accent. And we figured out he was asking us if we needed a place to stay other than our tents. And I was like, yes! So we went to Chester's house um, and his house was quite an adventure as well. But um, that was the place I showed you that had a bath. So that's all that mattered. Um, some days we had really awesome places to sleep, and some days we ended up sleeping behind a dumpster, but that was not the worst place that we stopped. Um, this is at the very last day, that's Leanne's tent. You can sort of see that there's it's just like covered in mud and disgustingness, but at the end of the day, even though it was hard, I always felt like I did a good job and I always went to bed feeling satisfied. Um, well satisfied is, is a term that um, comes from um, Huckleberry Finn, which I used quite a lot. Piloting on the Mississippi River was not work to me, it was play. Delightful play, vigorous play, adventurous play, and I loved it. Mark Twain has so many amazing quotes and um, I really like that one as well. Well satisfied. Um, this is me asleep in my tent. I'm not asleep, obviously I'm taking a picture, but moonlight at night. And then I made it all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. There's the Gulf of Mexico. Yay. Um, and then that night we were like, yay, we're done. We don't have to sleep in our tents anymore. And then the person who's going to pick us up forgot to pick us up. <laughs> so we slept in the bathroom. And our parents were like, that's disgusting. That's so bad. I feel so sorry for you. And we're like, we don't understand. This is an upgrade from our tents. <laughs> So there's our lessons learned, um, kind of in general, uh, to reduce the, um, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, these are some of the, the issues, the, the possible ways to mitigate that dead zone. Um, but uh, for you, I would like to suggest that you paddle your metaphorical river. The river itself is not for everybody, but um, 
But whatever inspires you, I want you to take that with you and go for it. Um, and then just kind of a, a little thing that I learned that if you love someone, let them nap. <laughs> Um, this is, they took this picture of me. I was like some completely asleep. I don't drink, so I'm not like passed out. That's just me <laughs> sleeping. Um, but we found a lot of random places to sleep um, in, in, and cowboy camping became something that was increasingly enjoyable and necessary as the bugs went down and the need to make our destination before it got cold got more important. Um, just not having to set up the tent was, was a great saver, so sleeping outside was kind of cool. Always take nothing but pictures and leave nothing but footprints. And then finally, um, so I kept a blog, which you can find links to on my Facebook page, which is probably the easiest way to find it. I also have cards that have the link to the blog itself. Um, so you can follow on there. I'm continuing, I always post things on there that have uh, relate that are related to the health and of cons and conservation of the Mississippi River and plastics and stuff like that. So I keep that active. Um, I'm also working on a memoir, and you can uh, look that up on Oatmeal Originals um, because we ate so much oatmeal, and because um, Leanne is also working on a memoir. So we combined our, our combined memoirs will be available through that site. Um, and yeah, that's all. So. Ta-da! <laughs>